Hi and welcome. Uh, if you are watching this and you happen to be a mechanical engineer, I would love to hear your thoughts in the comment section below, especially if uh, my uh, reasoning or my conclusions are not correct. On the other hand, if you are not a mechanical engineer, uh, I also think it's fair to say that uh, I could not design a laboratory test, nor did I have enough knowledge to create a computer simulate, simulation that uh, puts my conclusions and theory to a test. So take this with uh, just a grain of salt. Most of the things that I talk about are such that I have a very good understanding of both the practical side and the theoretical uh, background. But in this case, I think it's fair to say that my theoretical knowledge is just a little bit uh, lacking. So, with all that in mind, uh, today I will discuss what I consider to be a design flaw in DT Swiss Hub. Con exactly the model we are talking about is the XR20. Here it is. It's, it's not visible, they made a very, very strange font and everything, but this particular model is a bit older, XR20, but I have seen uh, the problems that I will discuss today, even in uh, many other DT Swiss hubs, and I have seen problems, so I wish to talk about that today. And this is the, the culprit, <laughs> the, the axle. They've made, uh, their, their hubs are very, relatively expensive and the materials used, used look to be of a good quality. But I noticed a problem with the design of this axle. What DT Swiss did is that they've created their axle, designed it so that it can be used to punch out the bearings from the hub. So just for those who are not familiar, the bearings are press fitted into the hub and you can use a hammer practically with some protection for the for the for the axle's end to hit it from the opposite side and punch out the bearing. So that is what they have designed into their axle. Uh, without that you could use a blind bearing puller or other tools to uh, service your your hub. So I don't think this is really necessary, but I think it poses some problems. What uh, the problem is I will try to show it here. Uh, they've made this section to go uh, a bit wider in diameter and then it abruptly uh, shrinks in diameter so you have a flat side on this section here and then it continues with a smaller diameter. In uh, practice this problem was first uh, encountered as far as I know well over a hundred years ago with uh, train axles. People had problems with train axles breaking even though they were built with uh, a lot of material, uh, great diameters, high strength and everything, they were breaking a lot and the, some good mechanical engineers figured out that the problem is that when you have a wider, di greater diameter and then followed by a narrower diameter, you, this section where it narrows down, this part has a lot more flexibility because it has a smaller diameter compared to this part and so there are uh, stresses in material at that point and effectively it is as if you took a, a wire and held it in place and then just worked the other way until it breaks. So you have a breakage at this junction and that is a problem. A solution is fairly simple. Here it's halfway done and here that's what I tried to draw. This is the problematic design where you have a greater diameter either going all the way greater or here increasing and then decreasing rapidly and then you have a narrower diameter. The solution looks a bit like this. You need to have a tapered change of diameter so that there is no single point where the difference in stiffness is significant from one end to the other and that lets all this work as more or less as one without a, without a, a separate point where 
the narrow rand will flex against and effect, uh, after a while break. Uh, if you examine this even closer, th this particular axle has a design like this. So they did make a taper, but when making it, they went for making even a smaller diameter. Here, just at the, the intersection. They made a smaller diameter and then increased it. Now, this uh, does make a taper, but it also makes this diameter even narrower. And in practice, I have seen this break right at this point. That is one problem that I see with this design. And I think that for some models, it can be fixed relatively easily by taking a 10 millimeter axle from of the same length from a Shimano hub or some other model, especially if you have one that's broken in other ways so that you can use the axle. It's more difficult to source them individually, in my country at least, otherwise. So that's one thing. Another thing that I've noticed is this is the position of the right hand side bearing. It's smaller than this one. The right hand side, this is one that sits on the left. But the, you see how much axle there is. Uh, there's a quite a long area of axle without any support of the bearing. The hub is held at the ends on your frame and you have a relatively long shaft without any, any bearing support. So there's more twisting and bending as you're riding and that exaggerates the before described problem. I will just show you now the old style, the standard style cup and cone hub. And this is a cup and cone hub. I've taken out the axle, but when you mount your wheel into a hub like this, uh, you can see that the bearings are right at the end and the cone is on, uh, mounted on the, on the axle itself as it is inserted. So the bearings are right at the ends of the hub and giving it a nice support. They are not all the way in the middle of the hub and that the bearings being near the middle of the hub was the problem with freewheel hubs that did not have these free hub mechanisms. So you just screwed on a freewheel and the bearings had to sit further inside and there was a lot of axle braking problems with those, especially as the number of gears went above five. So the stack was wider and there was more axle without any support. So those are some of the pro things that I've noticed and I've also uh, noticed that these do break while the axles in this in this design of, of hubs hardly ever break. I'm sure there are some faulty ones and uh, severely overloaded bicycles with hundreds of kilograms of weight or other experiments, but for general use, even for tandem bicycles or touring loaded, uh, I, I, I don't have a lot of experience with this braking while I've seen these cause problems. So that's uh, my, how do I say, uh, thinking about this problem and why it, uh, why I suppose it happens and at least one thing can be solved but the, the other problems are not as easily solved. And of course, if you take uh, another threaded axle potential concerns when you take for an axle from a hub like this is that it does have the outer diameter of the same uh, thickness but this here has uh, the flat sides to take the the bearing while the threaded ones do not have so i'm not sure how that would work in practice either way the dt swiss hubs are quite expensive and they are not indestructible yes you can replace bearings when they wear out and if you neglect them you won't have problems with pitted cups so that the whole hub is toast but you can have problems with axles and i'm not sure if they can be sourced for every model and i'm i don't think they are very cheap so that is the whole video i would like to hear your uh, comments in the comment section and hopefully learn something especially if I am wrong with my reasoning, because that would give me an opportunity to learn new things. And that's one of the, the things, the reasons that make this uh, uh, YouTube channel a worthwhile, world, worthwhile for me, at least. 
thank you very much for watching and I will see you in some other video after I've reassembled this hub. <laughs> Cheers, stay cool. Thank you.